So what we have here is we have all of these recent data breaches that have really happened over the past two months. One of the big things that's common throughout all of these data breaches is that the person who gets hurt in all of these breaches are the consumer. And whether companies are losing your credit cards, health records, or passwords, you, the customer, are left to pick up the pieces and deal with the problems that come with your identity potentially being stolen. If you're a smaller company, then a single data breach could put you out of business. It could ruin your reputation so that customers no longer want to do business with you. If you're a larger customer, you can very easily move on even and, uh, and handle the fallout associated with a data breach. And for instance, we have Hyatt Hotels that in two years have experienced two data breaches. One that I want to call out specifically is the Equifax breach, which happened early, uh, last month. And the most important thing associated with the Equifax breach is the fact that not only did they lose important information, they lost your social security number. And your social security number is something that you can't easily change. Typically, with these data breaches, you just get a new credit card, and then everything's fine moving forward. But you can't easily or at all change your social security number. So this has become a bigger problem. But as you can see, these are the data breaches that are just announced. There are lots of small companies out there, mom and pop organizations, that probably never know they had a data breach or never alert anyone that a data breach occurred. So even though these are large companies, we hear about them in the news, think about how many potential other data breaches could be occurring across the United States and the world. So why do all of these data breaches happen, and why are they seemingly occurring more frequently? So the Poneman Institute in their 2017 study analyzed data breaches and found that the majority of data breaches, 53%, did not happen due to malicious reasons. In fact, 28% happened due to human error, which is things such as people leaving computers unlocked, losing flash drives, leaving documents out of place. Whereas process failure is when a company has a solution in place or they purchase the solution, like AV or encryption. But over the years, they've relaxed that policy year after year after year. Because customers typically have been unhappy. Users have been unhappy. It's been too difficult for them to utilize their computers. Their computers have been running slow. Or so then when they've relaxed that policy, what it's done is it's caused the programs to no longer be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Or they buy it, encryption or AV, then they've just never gotten around to implement it because they've had other more important projects in place. If we look deeper into the human error category, we realize that this statistic here goes against what most people think. Most people think that devices are typically stolen from things like local coffee shops, airports, where users may be working remotely, whereas the majority of devices being lost or stolen actually happen in the person's own work area or vehicle. So people need to be more conscious about this fact and be more careful when they're leaving devices unlocked and accessible in their work area or vehicle. And so now, finally, that section on malicious data breaches. What kind of malicious attacks were they? And what does malicious actually mean or encompass? Well, first, 18% of those malicious breaches were dealt due to social engineering. 23% was hacking. And finally, 59% was malware. And the first component that we'll look a little bit more deeply at is that hacking section. And most people, when they think of hacking, they think of a person in their parents' basement who has been coding for years to later deploy their hack on unsuspecting victims. However, in reality, 63% of hacking is simply defeating weak passwords, trying out default passwords, guessing passwords, or users just simply saving their passwords on sticky notes or on applications and so forth. In 2007, in the Verizon data breach re report, we saw more of the same. We saw that there was a heavier increase of malicious breaches encompassing weak or stolen passwords. 
this actually went all the way up to 81%, which is an 18% increase year over year. We also see a few other comparisons to 2016 related to the use of malware in these breaches and the use of hacking in general. So let's take a look at the results. So most companies are actually saying that they have strict password policies in place. Um, or the re remaining 32% is actually saying that their employees uh, definitely do have some weak password policies or password uh, utilization practices. And we'll take a little bit more closely at that password um, section. Because the majority of hacking that we saw is based around weak or stolen passwords first. Can these answers be found on your Facebook account? Can they be found on your employee's Facebook account? Um, things like what city did you grow up in? What's your dog's name? What's your dream job? And so forth. These are important because if we go and we look at password unlock screens or password reset screens, typically they're asking these sorts of questions. These questions can be found usually on users' social media accounts. Or they freely share these sorts of answers with their friends, their family, colleagues. So it's very important not just to practice good password policies, but also translate that to your security questions. Because you don't want these security questions to easily be able to guess or figure it out, especially with users who have their Facebook public. Then someone can just find it via Google, find the answer to these questions, and go ahead and reset important passwords. Also, typically due to complexity requirements that companies set on their employees, what we find a lot of the time is that users are writing and storing their password in a document on their computer. They're storing it on a sticky note. They're writing it on a piece of paper and sliding it under their computer or their keyboard because they're having trouble remembering their own passwords. In fact, nowadays, the NIST and other organizations are now trying to recommend against having these password policies that are requiring users to change their password every so frequently because they know that users are typically doing things like this. They also go ahead and they do things like freely share their passwords with friends and family members. And usually we see this a lot in organizations that require employees to clock in and clock out on a day-to-day -day basis. Because if they're running late to work, they'll call their friend who might already be at the office and ask them, hey, can you go ahead and log me in or clock me in so it looks like I'm already there? So we see that even more in companies that do that. When password policies are in place, this is usually what we see with a typical user. If a password policy requires an eight-character password, a user might choose something like elephant. Then, if they go to another application or website that requires not just eight characters, but a number, users aren't thinking of a unique password. They're just going to tack a number on the end, whether it's a one, two, three, four, or so on. This continues when websites require a symbol, a capital. Users are reusing the exact same password base and only making the required changes. So the passwords really are not getting any more robust or any much more secure. We see a similar thing when companies require users to change their password every 90 days or every six months. Users are not fully changing their password. They're doing the least amount of changes necessary to get past the password policy. So if they have to change the number and the symbol, this is what they're doing. They're going down the keyboard. One, exclamation point, two, at sign, three, pound sign, and so forth. So that's why we're seeing these organizations recommend against requiring users to change their password. And they're pushing people to make users just have a much more complicated password to start with, 12 characters, 15 characters, and so forth. So they're trying to get people to practice better password policies when it starts. So they can't use basic words like you see here. So when data breaches occur due to, uh, and they steal passwords, they're extracted. Then it would be trivial to try all of the alternative options of the password base. So what that means is if a data breach happens and a password was stolen, 
and that password was elephant, for example. I could then go to a website, find where your email account uh, has an account, and then try whatever is required in their password requirements. So if the password requirement is a eight characters and a symbol, I can just go ahead and tack a symbol onto the password that I found and see if I can log in as that user. This is even more trivial when computers are involved. And when data breaches happen, there's lots of people out there who are going and trying those accounts, those passwords on every website they can think of to try and compromise the user accounts associated with that, those users that were breached. A great resource to inform your users about is this website, um, which will check all of the databases of compromised credentials to see if yours had been stolen at any point in time. You can go here, enter in your commonly used usernames or email addresses, and it will let you know if there's been a breach and what specifically was breached. If your password was stolen, it's recommended to completely change your password. Do not just change the number or symbol because we saw how easily that is to just figure out. So right now it currently checks over 245 data breaches and 4.7 billion compromised accounts. The next main component of malicious breaches was malware. And we typically see malware double every 12 to 16 months. In fact, the AV Test Institute registers over 390,000 new malicious programs every single day. A large component of that nowadays is ransomware. And ransomware, despite it rising to be one of the most talked about topics in security, has been around for a long time. It got its beginning way back in 2006 when important files on your computer were zipped up and password protected. Then it required users to text a premium SMS number in order to decrypt their files. And now this has evolved to be purely JavaScript, and it continues to evolve and become more and more advanced. VirusTotal is another website that's actually run by Google that will categorize all malware that is coming into its tool or website. This is great because it shows you the breakdown over the course of the last five days of threats and what kind they are. I like people to know about this website because it will show you all of the Android, Apple, or Linux-specific malware during that five-day interval. The scariest part about malware is that according to the Poneman Institute, it took companies on average 256 days to identify that a data breach occurred due to malware. Why is that? Because if you get infected by malware, you already, your already installed AV missed that malware once. And if the malware disabled or tampered with your AV, you may go on your day and assume that your AV is functioning properly. Only if the malware does something visible for users to see will you start to question if malware was on a computer which will eventually cause you to do more investigation, run some extra scans, and so forth, to see if you are actually infected. The final type of malicious breach is social engineering, which is deception that can be used across a broad range of attacks, from talking an employee into revealing their password to planting malware on systems through deceptive emails like the one seen here. And the best solution for social engineering is making sure that your users are educated and know that these sorts of threats exist. It's especially important for user education due to the fact that 54% of all inbound email is spam. This number may be shocking, but it's actually gone down from 84.9% in 2010. And the reason why it's gone down is because several major spam botnets have been shut down over the years, as well as the rise of web services like Gmail and Office 365, which have gotten much better at spam detection. One in 20 emails is actually malicious as well. And most people in this room, despite these high numbers, probably will say that they never, ever open phishing messages. When in fact, if we look at the statistics, 30% of recipients open phishing emails, and 12% open attachments. 
So the Fisher's payload is being deployed one out of every 10 emails they send out. So will social engineer attacks ever stop happening? Not at this level of success rate that people are still seeing today. 